afternoon. Pastor, when you hit that uh, part about confession, it reminded me of a time I was at a church and the guy came to me afterwards and said, Preacher, you went from preaching to meddling mighty quick. <laughs> so I think that uh, that probably got a little quiet around me. As I was thinking about uh, uh, this and preparing, uh, I had a flashback of time in my life, and I'm going to tell a little something to myself. Um, I was raised, like y'all know, just one of three boys. My dad uh, had dropped out of school in fourth grade and because of depression and worked his way through. But the Van Horns were notorious moonshiners, believe it or not, in North Carolina. And when we did our family history, we found most of the names down at the Atlanta Penitentiary where they sleep. <laughs> But uh, one of the cases I remember, my dad had a still that he had, and he would run moonshine. And I had an uncle, and it was right there in the middle of Lent, and my uncle would always come up, and when my aunt would go into a room, he would look at my dad and say, where's the jug? And he did that one day, and he said, Dick, where's the jug? And my dad said, well, Happy, it's Lent. He said, well, who has it? When are they going to bring it back? <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so as we get ready to think about this and talk about these things, uh, it, it's always nice to have a joyful heart. As I prepared for this, uh, I think it's really important for us to really look at the etymology of the word prepare, since that's what the Lent is about. And it says to make ready beforehand. That is the etymology of the word. We're making ready beforehand before we reach the time of Easter. The pain that is associated with it and the victory of resurrection that comes with that. So as we're making our way together through this, I hope that this is what we're doing. We're making ourselves ready beforehand. I brought with me a Bible. No, that doesn't shock anybody, hopefully. But for some reason in my family, because I worked for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and I was considered an in-home missionary and I was a lay minister in the Methodist Church, every relative that dies, I get their Bible. Okay? And so I have a couple of things, and it's very interesting. My mom's Bible, there's a picture in there of her mom uh, taken when she was 89 years old. And my mother died when she was 89 years old. In there, there was a... Uh, Forty clovers that had been pressed. And those were forty clovers that she had picked with her grandchildren. And there were memories that were there along those lines. Uh, but there's also things that are funny when you do these things. One for my mom is for her bookmark, she had the traffic signs for North Carolina because she was scared to death of having to take that test. <laughs> and so when she passed away, I had her Bible with me, and everybody laughed and knew my mom because she always panicked when it came time for the renewal, and she just knew they were going to test her. But this is one I found, and I'm trying to figure this out. One quart apple juice, one quart grape juice, three ounces of vinegar, one quarter cup of honey. Take two ounces of that. Well, it's that's right. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, you find these little things and you start wondering, why, why was it there? Well, as I, as I thought about today, I wanted to reflect back on something that really ha happened to me during the Lent season one time where I felt the need to really go to the scriptures. And the focus was to look at the times when God, God called people by their name. And that was something that really got me moved. For example, God calls us when we hide from him. Genesis chapter 3, when he's walking in the cool of the garden, he says, Adam, where are you? And he says, I hid myself because I was afraid. So God calls us when, he, when we are hiding from him. He calls us into account when he wants to instruct us. In Luke, we read the story of Martha and Mary. And remember, Martha's doing all these things, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Finally, she says, why don't you tell my sister to do something to help? And he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about so many things. So there are times when God calls us when he wants to instruct us. 
And then there's a time when he calls us when we make excuses not to do what he is leading us to do. The perfect example is when he goes to Moses and he's talking to Moses and Moses is making all kinds of excuses why he can't go to Egypt and he can't go to do all these other things. And God looks at him and he says, Moses, what are you holding in your hand? Bow it down. And Moses does, and it turns into a snake, if you remember that. And God says, reach down and pick it up. Now, there's some people who believe that Moses had a stuttering problem, and that's why he could not say, I'm not sound to my tongue. But could you imagine if he was, what he was saying, stuttering, and he said, God said, pick up that snake. <laughs> but you know, it was interesting that that's, that staff, after God touched it, was the staff he held over the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted. He held it up over his head, and the Amalekites defeated the, uh, the um, Amorites. And it's with that staff that he struck the rock, and water came forth from it. But isn't it interesting that that staff was just a stick until he allowed God to touch it? So God calls us sometimes to lay things down before him. And then there's a, there's a story that I want to focus on today because I think it's something that we all might need during this time of Lent. And it deals with an aspect of saying, is God calling us during this time of Lent to do something, to listen to him, to get deeper in our relationship with him, to forgive ourselves? But the story that I want to read today, this one I thought was I would focus on and it's uh, out of uh, 19 of Matthew. And it said, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him. And when Jesus, he says, Jesus was coming that way. And then I love this translation. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone to be with the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and I, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. So when you stop and think about that, there's a couple of points I think I'd like for us to take as we enter into this time of Lent and prepare, getting ready. The first thing that I see there is that God knows our name. He knows what we are going through and what we are dealing with. You should take comfort in knowing that he knows your name. I have a flashback of time that we could always tell, or maybe y'all knew this too, when we were out in the yard playing and little children, you could hear a lot of moms crying and screaming for their kids, but you recognize your mom's voice, right? And you recognize the name, and the name she used told you how much trouble you were in. <coughs> if I heard Drew, I was okay, but if I heard Drew Lane Van Horn, uh -oh, it was in trouble. But God knows your name, and he knows what we're going through. The second thing I would say we get from this is we need to be committed to the openness to be with God, even if it means going out on a limb. If you read this, Zacchaeus sprinted forward. He wanted to see Jesus so badly, he ran ahead of the crowd, climbed a tree, went out on a limb to be able to see that. So my question is, as we're in this time of Lent, what is the condition of your heart? Are we ready to run ahead to say expectantly, I want to come in contact with you, my Lord, during this time? 
even if it does mean going out on the limb. And then there's this great word I read here. He says, when Jesus reached the spot. Now, I truly believe that there are times that are very ordained and holy where we intersect with our God, and it is the spot that he puts us in where he reveals and talks to us. And I can give you back the fact that I shared with you a little bit about my dad. And of course, my dad, having been a moonshiner, was an alcoholic. And I remember that one night after years and years, I think I was 16 years old, I remember seeing my dad walking out to the back of the house in the woods. And he would just stand there for a few minutes. And then he would come back in the house. And that happened night after night after night. So one night I followed him out. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? And he pointed down and there was a stake in the ground. He said, this is the spot where I committed to God that I was not going to drink again. And every time I feel the urge, I come back to this spot. There's spots in our life. Could God have a spot for us during this time of Lent where he wants to engage and he says to you, Drew, come down. I have to stay with you. I want to be with you today. There's a sensitivity about that that I think we need to have. And the third part there is, fourth part is, we need to be in a position to open and receive what God has to offer for us. And I have to throw out a caution that what he may want to offer us may not be what we want to hear. But if we're prepared for Easter, to celebrate the victory and the salvation and the resurrection and the new life that comes, would we want to hear what he has to say we need to do to be prepared? It's always something uh, that rings within my heart. And I will share with you a time in my life when I heard God's voice to me. I was a in graduate school at Camden University. And I had reached a point in time in my life where I was just really struggling with God. Who he was, what was going on in the world, I was just thinking, I don't know. I think I could do a better job myself. And so I went backpacking and camping over spring break with the young lady that I was dating and her brother. And we went up into uh, the mountains of North Carolina, and we parked the car, and we walked three miles up the road, four miles back into the woods, to a point where I always used to camp. And we had to carelessly cross these rocks to get to the other side of the stream. Well, during the night, a flash flood came. And woke up the next morning, and the rocks were covered. The water was already into the camp, and it was up to the tent. And in my arrogance, I said, I'll get us out of here. So I put on my rain suit, and I went up and climbed up a little bit. I had to tie the rope around me, and I told them, hang on to the rope. I'm going to cross here, and I'm going to go get help. I got about halfway down, and the water just went. And I went straight down to the bottom. And fortunately, they held the rope and they pulled me back up. And this rain suit was ripped off of me. Kind of a little bit like my pride. And so for the next 24 hours, we hiked down the stream, trying to find a place to cross. And I was in control. And it got dark. And so I built a little lean-to, and we had no food. I was soaking wet. They were wet because it had been raining, and the temperature was dropping. So they set into the little lean-to, and then I was going to make the ultimate sacrifice. I was going to use my body heat 
to lay on top of them to keep them warm. And as I did that, it was quiet. And I could hear dream. You can lay there in your arrogance and in your self-satisfaction or you can call upon me. So just very quietly I said, Lord, you're absolutely right. There's nothing I can do to help. Now we're back six miles into the mountains after a rainstorm and a flash flood. And I heard voices. And I came out of the lean-to and there were two people walking on the other side of the stream. No backpacks. They had walking sticks. And I yelled, help, we're in trouble. And they walked down and they said, can't you get yourself across? And I said, I cannot. And they said, we know. And then they left. They left. Two hours later, the rescue squad came back, shot a rope across the river, we tied it off, they zipped us back across. And as I got across, I looked at them and I said, I'd like to meet the two people who contacted you. And they looked at me and they said, all we can tell you is we were getting ready to leave. Something told us to stay. And we started playing cards. And we got a phone call that told us exactly where we were, but there was no name. <coughs> now, friends, as we think about when God calls our name and what he can do and how we prepare for such a time to have an encounter with him, it may not always be sunshine. It may be the rain. So my encouragement to you is listen for God calling your name. Be open to what he is asking you to do or telling you to do. If you do that, I will guarantee you that this Easter will mean something special to you than it already is. Gracious God, in the times of the day, it gets so heavy. We listen to the music, we listen to the television, we hear all the troubles of the world, we hear other people talking. But now, during this time of Lent, would you please make us sensitive? hear your voice, to hear you speaking our name. We ask that you would give us an energy to run forward to meet you just as Zacchaeus did, to do all that we can to want to be there to encounter you. And Father, we pray that if this is to occur, if this is your will, that you would give us the strength to accept what you have And we ask this in the name that we all have, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll end today with 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. 298, we'll sing all four verses of that. So let's sing. 